Okay. Welcome. I don't understand. Jim, are you there? You, you can go ahead and start. This is coming to you live from Monte Vista Grove in Pasadena, California. My name is Jim Simons, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our weekly convocations. Today, our speaker is Ron White, and he will be talking about his book. And I'd like to have you note that uh, if you want a, one of these books, uh, you can contact him at ron.white at mindspring.com. If you do not reside in Pasadena, he'll be glad to send you a book book plate that he will personalize for you or a friend. So uh, we'll begin our program with our scripture from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verses 1 to 9. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountains, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the weak, meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Merciful God, we come to you today with these beatitudes of Jesus in our minds and in our hearts. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers. Oh God, we pray that these qualities may guide each of us as we face the challenges of our time. We do not only pray for peace, but we Pray that we may be the peace we seek, that we may embody purity of heart, that we may live the mercy Jesus calls for in the world. Today, we express thanks for our speaker as he tells the story of the private life of Abraham Lincoln, a life that models the Beatitudes of Jesus in so many ways. Oh God, empower us to be channels of your love in our troubled world today. 
We pray in the spirit of Jesus. Amen. Ron White is now a scholar in residence at Community Presbyterian Church in San Marino, California. And it is my pleasure to ask the pastor of the church, Jessica Von Lauer, to introduce him. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much, Jim. It's wonderful to be with all of you today on this exciting event. Um, and it's a joy to be able to introduce Ron. Ron is the author of two New York Times bestselling presidential biographies, American Ulysses, A Life of Ulysses S. Grant. It won the 2017 William Henry Seward Award for Excellence in Civil War Biography. He is also the author of A. Lincoln, a biography published in 2009. USA Today said that if you read one book about Lincoln, make it A. Lincoln. His new book is Lincoln in Private, what his most personal reflections tell us about our greatest president. The Wall Street Journal hailed it as an intimate character portrait and fascinating inquiry into the basis of Lincoln's energetic, curious mind. He is also the narrator for the Random House audiobook of Lincoln in Private. Ron has written Lincoln's Greatest Speech, the Second Inaugural, a New York Times notable book, and The Eloquent President, a portrait of Lincoln through his words, which was in Los Angeles Times, New York, Los Angeles Times bestseller. Ron is generous in intellect, in character, and in kindness, and he is a favorite friend of mine which makes it a real honor to introduce him today, Ron White. Thank you, Jessica. I value our friendship so much. <laughs> and thanks to residents of Monte Vista Grove who've offered encouragement and questions and interest and, and conversation partners in the sort of gestation and then the writing and the publication and now the response to Lincoln in private. In the 21st century, C-SPAN has done four presidential historian surveys. They do this after their change of presidents. In all four, Lincoln has finished number one. And yet, Lincoln is now a contested person. People are taking his name down from public schools. So I was intrigued to find out, is there something in the private Lincoln that perhaps we have not seen in the public Lincoln? I've always been fascinated with diaries. John Meacham's marvelous biography of George H.W. Bush, he tells us in the preface was only possible because both George and Barbara allowed him to see their diaries. So it was 1863 and Lincoln was now under attack. The union was not doing well with the war. It was now being called Mr. Lincoln's war. Protest meetings were taking place all across the country. One took place in Albany, New York, and at the end of the protest meeting, they crafted what they called the Albany Resolves, and they sent them to Lincoln, asking him to respond. Well, he often did respond by writing what he called a public letter and publishing it in a newspaper, which would then be circulated in many newspapers. Well, as he sat down to respond to the Albany Resolves, a young Iowa congressman entered his office, James F. Wilson, and watching Lincoln write, he said, oh my goodness, this is amazing that you can sit down and do all of this from scratch. And Lincoln said, oh no. And he pointed over to an open desk drawer. He said, it's all in there. That's where I save my best thoughts. I never let one of those ideas escape me. But they've escaped us. Over the years, we have encountered the public Lincoln of the Gettysburg Address, the Emancipation Proclamation, the Second Inaugural Address, but spread across the volumes that collect Lincoln's works, Hay and Nicolay, his secretaries, published 10 volumes, Roy Basler and editors published nine volumes in the 1950s, are all of these notes or what the editors called fragments. Now, why do they call them fragments? Because they are fragmentary. It's like you and I would be writing a note to ourselves, and suddenly the email comes in, the telephone rings, there's a knock on the door, and you leave the note and you do not finally finish it. 
So what I want to do in Lincoln in private is ask the question, is there anything in the private Lincoln that we have not yet seen in the public Lincoln? Let's remember his law partner, William Herndon, called him the most shut mouth man who ever lived. Lincoln was, believe it or not, a very private person. So I wanted to find out how many of these notes or fragments are there. So I contacted the Lincoln Papers Project, an ongoing project in Springfield, Illinois. I learned there are 111 of these notes. They have never before prior to this book been published together. Scholars have seen one here, one there, but for many people, as I've published this book and been privileged to speak to audiences, it's like entering a whole new territory, a world that we didn't quite know exists. So I've titled my chapters, the, the Lyrical Lincoln, the Fiery Lincoln, the Defeated Lincoln, the Theological Lincoln. There are so many different aspects. I think a lot of modern politicians are playing on one octave. Lincoln's playing on many, many octaves. And think about it, he had but one year of formal education. Boys in his time only received education in January and February when traveling teachers came and they, it was too cold to work with their fathers on their farms. And so Lincoln may have had five, possibly six January and February's, it added up to one. A great part of this book, and I'm so grateful to my publisher, Random House, is, and maybe we can put this up now, these notes are printed for you to see in color. Lincoln takes all kinds of different pages, just what happens to be at hand, and starts writing this note. Let's look at the first one. It's going to come up on our screen. It's called the, the Niagara. He doesn't title them, I, I should say that. He doesn't date them. He doesn't sign them. Well, how do we know they're Lincoln? Because of his distinctive handwriting. He never thought any of us would ever be talking about this on December 2nd, 2021 in Pasadena, California, or from wherever you are watching. Lincoln begins this note, a little small handwriting for you to see, but notice he does have good handwriting. Niagara Falls, exclamation point. Good handwriting. What mysterious power is it that millions and millions are drawn from all parts of the world to gaze upon Niagara Falls? Let's remember that we now think of Yosemite and Yellowstone and Glacier and the Grand Canyon, but that was unknown when Lincoln wrote this. The United States felt an inferiority complex to Europe and England in terms of culture, intellect, but what we had that they didn't have was great natural wonders. And Niagara Falls was the chief natural wonder. So moving forward down a little bit further in the, in the, in the uh, note, but still there is more. It calls up the indefinite past. When Columbus first sought this continent, when Christ suffered on the cross, when Moses led Israel through the Red Sea, nay, even when Adam first came from the hand of his maker, then as now, Niagara was roaring here. The eye of that, eyes of the, that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as ours do now. Contemporary with a whole race of men and older than the first man, Niagara is strong and fresh today as 10,000 years ago. The mammoth and the mastodon, now so long dead, that fragments of their monstrous bones alone testify that they ever lived have gazed on Niagara in that long, long time, never still for a single moment, never dried, never froze, never slept, never rested, comma, <laughs> he didn't finish. Well, what's fascinating is I'm suggesting that this is a side of Lincoln that most of us do not know. Well, Lincoln's law partner, William Herndon, thought he knew Lincoln best, and after Lincoln's death, why he would become an interpreter of Lincoln. So when Lincoln returned to Springfield, he was in the middle of his only term in Congress, Herndon told Lincoln that he also had recently been to Niagara. And this is what Herndon wrote about Lincoln, claiming he knew him better than anyone. 
He had no eye for the magnificence and grandeur of the scene, for the rapids, the mists, the angry waters, and the roar of the whirlpool. This Lincoln, according to Herndon, was heedless of beauty and awe. Obviously, Herndon had never read this note. Well, there's another window that I want to open up on Lincoln. We think of him as the politician. He served four terms in the Illinois legislature, one term in Congress. He ran for the Senate twice, was defeated twice in Illinois, and then served as president. He served 23 years as a lawyer. He became a, a marvelous lawyer after his single term in Congress, where he had accrued a lot of uh, angst because he, he criticized the war with Mexico. He demanded to know where the Mexicans invaded the United States. He said, I'm quite convinced the United States invaded Mexico. He came back, thought his political career was over and became a full-time lawyer. Now, the way you studied law in those days was you became a, an apprentice to a lawyer. You came to their office, you read with them. But Lincoln spent almost half of his year out on what was called the Eighth Judicial Circuit, a portion of central Illinois as large as the state of Connecticut. So he determined that he could not take the time to mentor young lawyers in his office in Springfield. So he wrote out notes for a lecture to lawyers. He never gave the lecture, at least we have no public record of it. But his notes are remarkable. He begins this way, I am not an accomplished lawyer. Oh my goodness, he was. Already he was one of the great lawyers of Illinois. I find quite as much material for a lecture in those points where I have failed as in those where I have been moderately successful. Can you imagine a modern CEO, politician, president of a college or university, saying I find much as, as much material in those points where I have failed as in those where I have been moderately successful. Moderately, he was enormously successful. One other part of this notes for lawyers, discourage litigation. Frontier Illinois was a place where people in their own words was, went to law. Everybody was suing each other. Persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can. Point out to them how the nominal winner is often the real loser in fees, expenses, and waste of time. As a peacemaker, the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man. There will still be business enough. Lincoln was assassinated 41 days after his second inaugural address. He was a fine war president. He checked books out of the Library of Congress to teach himself how to be a war president. He looked forward because he thought he'd be a better peace president. As a peacemaker, the lawyer has a superior opportunity. Well, the largest portion of these notes of the Lincoln before he's president concern the issue of slavery. And that's the contested issue today. What did Lincoln really think about slavery? Was the Emancipation Proclamation simply a military or political move, maneuver? Did he really care? about African-Americans? Well, one of the most fascinating of the fragments, the only one not contained in Springfield, is held in the home of a friend in Dallas, Texas, who has his own library and his own full-time curator. Lincoln writes this fragment. Remember, I said they're not titled. But in 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed. This opened the possibility that slavery could extend to the West into the territories. Stephen Douglas was the author of this Kansas-Nebraska Act. He argued that people should be able to vote for slavery. Lincoln was appalled, you can vote for slavery? So he held his fire for a few months in 1854, and then in the midst of preparing to speak against Douglas and the Kansas-Nebraska Act, he ultimately would offer an address of the 17,000 words he offered this remarkable fragment. Tiara, let's look at this together. If A can prove, however conclusively, that he may have right enslaved B, why may not B snatch the same argument 
and prove equally that he may enslave A. You say A is white and B is black. It is color then, the lighter having the right to enslave the darker. Take care. By this rule, you are to be a slave to the first man you meet with a fairer skin than your own. Oh, you do not mean color exactly. You mean whites are intellectually the superiors to blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them. Take care again. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. But say you, it's a question of interest. And if you can make it your interest, you have the right to enslave another. Very well, and if he can make it his interest, he has the right to enslave you. We're asking today, or we should be asking today, what are the qualities that we want in political leaders? I think one of the qualities that I would lift up is intellectual curiosity. These fragments, these notes just are packed full of intellectual curiosity. Lincoln always begins with a problem and then tries to move to some sort of action. Well, I'm suggesting that the Lincoln in private is not the Lincoln in public. So what's another aspect of this private Lincoln? Remember that contests, contests for the Senate until the early 20th century were done in states, state legislatures. So in 1855, Lincoln runs for the Senate. He runs against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He runs against slavery and he leads on the first seven ballots. But then he discovers that he's not able to win. And so worried that another Republican, believe it or not, who is for the Kansas-Nebraska Act will capture the Senate, Lincoln withdraws and throws his votes to a Democrat who was against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Publicly, Lincoln was very fine. It's all right. I will just be fine. Privately, he wrote this note. The real opponent he knew was Stephen Douglas, the author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This is what he writes. 22 years ago, we can date this note. Judge Douglas, he called him judge because that was his first position, and I first became acquainted. We were both young then, he a trifle younger than I. Even then, we were both ambitious. Lincoln never denies his ambition. I perhaps quite as much as he. With me, and notice how he underlines words. Well, you can't see this one. He underlines key words in his notes as he does in his speeches. With me, the race of ambition has been a failure, a flat failure. With him, it has been one of splendid success. The public Lincoln, kind of suspicious of sharing too much of one's feelings in public, never would utter these words. Listen to them again. With me, the race of ambition has been a failure, a flat failure. In less than four years, Lincoln would be elected president of the United States. One of the most interesting uh, notes, and we're gonna have Tiara put that up on the screen now, is what's called the definition of democracy. This has an interesting story as to how we even have this note. Mary Lincoln often comes in for pretty bad press. I'm more sympathetic to her than recent biographers and historians. She lost her son, Eddie, at age three and a half in 1850. She lost Willie at age 11 in 1862. She perhaps was holding her husband's hand when he was assassinated at Ford's Theater. She then lost Tad a few years later at age 17. The word was that Mary Lincoln was not doing well mentally. And so in 1875, she sat in a courtroom in Chicago and a 12 person male jury in a few minutes declared that she was insane and she was consigned to the Bellevue Sanatorium for female patients. While she was there, a female lawyer, Myra Bradwell, worked with her husband to see if she could get Mary released. Here's an interesting backstory. Myra Bradwell wanted to be the first female lawyer, but the state of Illinois 
turned down her appeal, turned down her application because it said a woman cannot be a lawyer because a woman's chief job is to be wife and mother. So she appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court came back with the same answer. A woman cannot be a lawyer because her first job is to be a wife and a mother. But she had legal skills and she got Lincoln, she got Mary Lincoln out of the insane asylum in about six weeks. And when she did, Mary Lincoln gave her a number of gifts, uh, things that had been given to her husband from foreign leaders. But the most interesting thing she gave is this definition. As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this to the extent of the difference is no democracy. Wow. Lincoln, as he came back into political life, came at first to try to deal with the awful affront of slavery. As a 19-year-old, he had gone down from Indiana to New Orleans, taking a load of produce on a boat. And when he got there, he was appalled to see on one side were male slaves, on the other side were female slaves with their children. He understood very quickly that they would be sold off in different directions and marriage not being legal among slaves, they would never be in family again. But now as he moves forward, he understands a different truth, that slavery is not simply bad for African-American people, for Black people. It's bad for white people. It's corroding the American culture. And one thing I want to note in this is Lincoln's use of the negative. This is a fascinating thing, I, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this to the extent of the difference is no democracy. I tip my hat to Lincoln Scholar at Knox College at Galesburg, Illinois, Douglas Wilson, for pointing out Lincoln's continual use of the negative. Go back and read the Gettysburg Address. You might think that the way to express an idea is, I thought it was, in a positive way. But Lincoln is really adept at using the negative to make his point. Let's do one more fragment. Uh, we'll put up now what's called the Meditation on the Divine Will. Remember I said Lincoln didn't title any of these, but when John Hay, his young secretary, found this in his desk drawer after the assassination, he gave it the title, Meditation on the Divine Will. This is the theological link that I want to lift up. One of the continuing questions about Abraham Lincoln was, was he a religious person? He did not join a church, and yet he wasn't a joiner. He spoke at many temperance societies, but he never joined them. And so here we have this remarkable note. I spent a lot of time writing a first Lincoln book on Lincoln's greatest speech, the second inaugural, March 4, 1865, Lincoln in 701 words mentions God 14 times, quotes the Bible four times, invokes prayer three times. But no one that day knew that two and a half years early, Lincoln had on his faith journey sketched out some of his thoughts about the role of God in the Civil War. What happened was at the end of August 1862, the North suffered another disastrous defeat called the defeat at Manas Second Manassas or Second Bull Run, Lincoln called an emergency cabinet meeting. Fortunately for us, three of his cabinet secretaries kept diaries. One of them said Lincoln said he was filled with such bitter anguish that he almost felt like hanging himself. Almost felt like hanging himself. We believe, remember there's no date, that afternoon he sat down with pen and paper and in his typical way, I think he would have spoken the words out loud before he wrote them on the paper. Lincoln and many of his contemporaries read out loud. Everyone read out loud until the last 100, 120 years, we got to a place where the teacher must let one afternoon said, Johnny, you're disturbing Mary, would you please read to yourself? And we've adopted the really bad habit of reading silently. Lincoln said he read out loud because now he had the reading of two senses, the ear and the eye. Here's what he wrote. The will of God prevails. 
In great contests, each party claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be, one must be wrong. God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. The logical Lincoln. In the present civil war, it is quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party. And yet the human instrumentalities, working just as they do, are of the best adaptation to affect his purpose. I'm almost ready to say this is probably true, that God wills this contest and wills that it shall not end yet. By his mere quiet power, Lincoln had grown tired of the noisy God he'd experienced during the Second Great Awakening in Kentucky and Southern Indiana. By his mere quiet power on the minds of the now contestants, he could have either saved or destroyed the Union without a human contest. And having begun, he could give the final victory to either side any day. Well, now we know why this is a private note. You're not suggesting, are you, President Lincoln, that he's going to give the final victory to the Confederacy, possibly? No, this is only for his eyes only. Yet the contest proceeds. Well, in conclusion, I've had a great experience of speaking to high school students from Massachusetts to Hawaii, usually 11th graders who are studying American history. I recall one afternoon speaking at Poly High School here in Pasadena, and uh, I asked the 11th graders, they were all assembled in one large room, how long did, it, did they think it took Lincoln to write these notes? And they answered, oh, a minute or three minutes or four minutes. And I said, well, what about an hour or two hours? And in the back, the faculty were all standing up and applauding. I could see them. Lincoln took the time to think. Do we take time to do that today with our screens, with our busy schedules? This kind of deep thinking doesn't happen by dashing it off. Lincoln is a deep thinker with intellectual curiosity who's willing through his law training to look at all sides of issues. During his preparation to understand the role of religion in the Civil War, he read a book by a Presbyterian minister called Slavery Ordained of God. And uh, he, he wanted to read what this side said. He's very angry at the end, but he wanted to see both sides. So Lincoln in private is an opportunity for us to see a different Lincoln than perhaps the public Lincoln we've encountered in schools or in biographies or in history books. I think it reveals to us a very profound person. He's a 19th century person. He can't help us with climate change. And yet I think the values that he incarnates are values that we can think about for ourselves and our democracy today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Jim, I believe you're mute. Did you wanna? Um, thank you for that lovely presentation. I'm gonna uh, send out a poll right now if you guys would take a moment to answer it. And if you guys have any questions, I will unmute you guys in a second. And also you can type your questions in the chat box. Ron, I have a question for you. Uh, you had us read the Beatitudes at the beginning. Blessed are the peacemakers. And uh, you think of Lincoln as being, uh, we think of him as a peacemaker. And you said that when he was a lawyer, he always tried to make peace between people before they get to court, because that was going to be better for everybody all the way around. But how did he deal with the fact that he ended up in the bloodiest war the country has ever had 
as uh, having to go to war and uh, sending uh, young men to their death. Uh, it must have been a, a, a terribly difficult thing for him to do that since he, he was a peacemaker. I just, uh, do you have any reflections on that? Lincoln as the peacemaker who ends up waging the worst war we ever had. Where's the, I can't hear the, hear it. Ron, you're muted. All right, now you can hear me. There we go. Uh, yes, Jim, it had to be a wrenching decision. Think of this, we, for a hundred years, we thought that there were 620,000 dead and a young person about 15 years ago studied the census for 1860 and 1870 and came up with a new figure, 750,000 dead wow. in a nation of but 30 to 40 million people. Unbelievable. Lincoln came to the decision that there had to be a hard war and a soft peace. The soft piece is a surprising second inaugural address. Believe it or not, after his death, and it took me a while to finally discover this, many in his own Republican Party, the so-called radical Republicans, were glad that Lincoln was dead because he was too soft. He would be too soft to the South. So yes, it's a difficult question. If the war had not gone forward, slavery would have gone forward. Is that the nation that we wanted or would we go forward with two nations or three nations or four nations? It's very hard for us to understand today that people were fighting this war to preserve the union. The metaphor of the union means little to us today, but this was their basic motivation. Once the war progressed for Lincoln, he understood that the union had no meaning unless we abolished slavery. We have a question from Lynn Cheney. What are the yes. factors that are causing moderns to rethink Lincoln's uh, posture on slavery? I'm sorry, Lynn, would you say that again? I've got to listen to that. I, I can read my question. Uh, what are the <laughs> oh, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> what are the factors that are causing <clears throat> moderns to rethink Lincoln's posture on slavery and uh, to be so critical of uh, uh, what are the factors that are causing some to rethink Lincoln's posture on slavery? Well, sometimes, and we know this phrase, there's a lot of proof texting going on. So, for example, the famous Freedmen's Memorial, which was established in 1876, where Frederick Douglass spoke. He, early in his speech, talks about the fact that Lincoln was the white man's president. So that's been lifted up large scale in the last year or two. But if you read through the entire speech, as he gets towards the end, he said, but as the white man Lincoln was speedy, fiery, fast. So there's a balance there that we don't see. Lincoln is also on a journey. You cannot deny that early in his life, he was for the, uh, the uh, colonization movement to have African-Americans return to Africa. But again, the whole story is not shown because many of the leading African-American bishops and others were also involved in the colonization movement for they saw this as the way to Christianize Africa and to, to make Liberia a, a, a Christian country. So how to take the full Lincoln, it, 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 this is the difficult thing. When they took down the, the uh, name off of a school uh, statue, I guess it was in San Francisco, someone said, don't you want to confront, don't you want to consult the historians? And the leader of the movement said, why would we do that? <laughs> and the same thing happened in Chicago. I mean, historians, really renowned historians have written about this, but many times people don't want to hear this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not defending Lincoln, but I'm also, it's hard to say, especially to younger people, we need to understand people in their own time. I think we come across Lynn so often so morally superior. Oh my goodness, are we morally superior to people in the 18th and 19th century? I wonder what they'll say about us 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. 
And did you want to ask your next question as well? Sure, I, I'm, I, I have a million questions, but I've, oh, okay. I'm, trying, I'm trying to be um, uh, prudent here. Um, any musings about what Lincoln might have to say about the current state of our, uh, in quotes, uh, democracy? Thank you, Lynn. What would Lincoln have to say about the current state of our democracy? I think he would be incredibly sad. For one of the great qualities of Lincoln was respect, respect. As he starts out in his seven debates with Stephen Douglas, he said, now I wanna make it very clear that Stephen Douglas is a person who really loves America. Stephen Douglas in the first two debates would call Lincoln 32 times a black Republican. He would just tar and feather him. But Lincoln always was a person who gave respect to the other side. This, I think, in many ways came from his law training, where his second partner that he was with, Stephen Trigg Logan, said, you need to understand both intellectually and emotionally the side of the other. So when Lincoln returns from his single term in Congress, William Herndon says, well, we've got to subscribe to some anti-slavery newspapers. And Lincoln said, I completely agree. Let's pick out the ones we want to subscribe to. And then he tells Herndon, but I also want to subscribe to a newspaper, the leading one of Richmond and Charleston, South Carolina. And Hearn says, well, why in the world do we do that? Because he said, we need both sides at the table. And I think Lincoln would be very, very worried that we no longer have both sides at the table. We each are in our own silos and we seem unable to speak with each other with respect saying, you are an American, you are a patriot. I disagree with your ideas. I disagree with your policy strongly, but I'm not going to demonize you as somehow not a quote unquote real America. We have a question from Bruce Hawkins, and then I believe I saw Larry, your hand raise. Um, let's go first with Bruce. How did Grant benefit from his knowledge and support of Lincoln's commitments? Thank you, Bruce. How did Grant benefit? from his knowledge and support of Lincoln. I often think of these two as kind of a mutual admiration society. Lincoln, if you will remember, had to deal with all kinds of generals, especially McClellan, who overemphasized the force of the opposition, who said we're not quite ready, who just made excuse after excuse and grant another Western man, uh, Missouri, Illinois, really, Ohio, was one who didn't complain, didn't uh, boast about himself. We don't use the word self-effacement anymore. We might use the word humility, but this, this was the quality. I had the privilege of speaking two years ago at the invitation of the Library of Congress to some members of Congress at a breakfast meeting. And when it was over, a woman came forward and she was a wife of a congressman from the South. She's told me her husband had been a congressman for 20 years. And I'd been talking about the quality of humility in both Lincoln and Grant. And with tears in her eyes, I'll never forget this. She asked me this question. Do you think humility can ever return to American politics? Can it ever return? Well, even a few years ago, character was listed as one of the top qualities for American politicians no longer. No longer do people believe that character is one of the top qualities for American politicians. Larry, if you wanna go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, um, so Ron, uh, when we were talking about uh, Lincoln's uh, position uh, and, and his, his work, uh, isn't it true that he, was a, he really was a quintessential politician uh, of the kind that we would want to have. And though he was a, an, a, an ardent, an, uh, ardent anti-slavery person, he also was even more committed to the union. Is, isn't that true? And, and those had to be held in tension, particularly during the war. That's true, Larry. And, and what I think you're suggesting is that it's easy to lift up the idealism of Lincoln, the sort of superhero Lincoln, but Lincoln was a supreme politician. He was a machine politician. He knew how to get out the votes. 
he would be, he counted the votes from county to county in Illinois. And this is a quality that we, we may miss. So for example, in 1848, uh, the candidate for the Whig party, the Whigs were the predecessors of the Republicans, was Zachary Taylor. And Zachary Taylor was a general of the War of Mexico. He was a slave owner. We might criticize Lincoln there. Lincoln desperately wanted Henry Clay to be the Whig candidate for president. But when he wasn't, he said, well, I, I'm going to campaign for Zachary Taylor. He's not everything that I want, but I want the Whig party to be winning this election. So Lincoln, for all of his idealism, understood how to be a machine politician. One of the funniest things to me today is if I were to say it this way, if you'll allow me to say this, there's two basic qualities by which one needs to run for politics today. First, you need to say very loudly, I have no experience. I have no experience. That's my chief qualification. I have no experience. And secondly, I can fund my own campaign. I have no experience, but I have a lot of money. Lincoln would be appalled if those are the qualifications by which people are stepping forward to run for politics today. Not at all. We have another question from Norm Thomas. Yes, today, Norm. <laughs> today in the Supreme Court, oral arguments on abortion. Much of the conservative argument is that what power is not given to the federal government by the Constitution should be given to the states. Do Lincoln's private papers give any insight on Lincoln's attitude on state rights on issues beyond slavery? Thank you, Norm. I think Lincoln would almost fall over in laughter today. Lincoln had a great story where he talked of two men who were wrestling each other. And the more they wrestled, they wrestled out of each other's clothes into the clothes of the other. Lincoln and the Republicans were the party of a cent strong central government. Democrats were the party of states' rights. Now it's become exactly the opposite. The person I long admired was Senator Mark Hatfield of Oregon. When I published my first book, I learned that he had his own private Lincoln Library, and I had the privilege of meeting with him in his office in Portland. He served five terms, 30 years in the United States Senate, and I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, Ron, he said, when I stepped down from the Senate, I looked around and I said, all my colleagues are Confederates. All my colleagues are Confederates. I mean, the Republican Party is really the Republic, the Confederacy rising again. That's the heart and soul, the strength, the pushback, whether it's mandates or anything else, Lincoln would be appalled by this because he and Grant understood that as the nation became a modern nation, you needed a strong central government. Dr. White, uh, I'd like to ask you a question. Yes, sir. Um, I, I, I'd like to know where you think Lincoln got his humility. Where did that come from? Ah, that's a wonderful question, Dean. Uh, a little bit of his own religious story, which I didn't have time to tell. Growing up in uh, Kentucky and Southern Indiana, his parents attended Baptist churches. It was the period of the Second Great Awakening. He was really turned away from the emotionalism of that kind of religion. He became what we have experienced with our children or grandchildren or parishioners. He rejected the faith of his parents. When he moved to Illinois and took lodging in the little town of New Salem. He wrote a paper criticizing revealed religion and the Bible. We have this from various people who remember it. Someone ripped it out of his hand and threw it in the fire. Not a smart thing to do for an aspiring politician. When Eddie died in Springfield, he looked around for Charles Dresser, the Episcopal minister who had married he and Mary. He was out of town. So we turn to James Smith, the new young Presbyterian minister. When he comes to Washington, D.C., the missing person in the Lincoln story is Phineas Densmore Gurley, pastor of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church, number one in his class at Princeton Seminary, a student of the then young Charles Hodge. 
So I think there's a story here of Lincoln's emerging faith. It's a faith story that is not there before, but when life tumbles in, have we not seen this with our parishioners? When life tumbles in, people rethink what they believe and how they're going to act. He cannot readopt the faith of his parents. That's too emotional. But he finds in the Presbyterian tradition, both in Springfield and Washington, a more thoughtful, rational faith. And I think his own life story of what he calls the right to rise keeps him in place. He never forgets where he comes from. And I think this is part of his humility. It's Lynn with another question, uh, Ron. Sorry, <laughs> I could go on forever. I'm, I am trying to hold back, but it's difficult. Um, I'm interested uh, just to know what this process was like for you personally to write this particular book. Were you working with the original um, notes or with copies? What was this like for you personally reading notes that few people have ever seen? Thank you, Lynn. That's, that's, a, that's an important question. I'm glad you asked it. Interestingly, uh, the notes are all there for one to read. And I find myself starting to write notes. I've been living with Lincoln for 30 years. I wake up at three o'clock in the morning with some insight and I have something right beside me there where I can write a note. As I said earlier, I've been very intrigued with diaries and what they tell us that the per private person is not always the public person. What's coming out, is it not in our politics today is unfortunately some of the private revelations of our public leaders are not very hopeful or positive. So I want to know, is the private Lincoln going to be different than the public Lincoln? What qualities are there in these notes? And so I simply started out several years ago to give a lecture on one note or a lecture on another note. And then I thought, well, what if I looked at all of them together? Do they say something to us together? So that's been kind of my journey. It's been a fascinating kind of quest to get in the private Lincoln. We have another question from Nancy Mackey. Yes, in Nancy. The, in the surviving notes, does Lincoln ever write despairingly about a political person? Very interesting. In the surviving notes, let, let me say something about that. No one has asked this question, but it's been asked before. Does Lincoln speak about Mary Lincoln? Does he speak about his children? No, not in the surviving notes. And I want to emphasize surviving because in the 19th century, people burned their letters and burned their diaries. When Mary Lincoln got ready to go to Washington in 1861, she went out to the back alley and in what she called her burn pile, I think she burned all the correspondence between she and Abraham. This was private stuff and she didn't want anybody to see it. But in the notes, Nancy, there is no, never an indication where Lincoln is uh, mean-spirited. He's not a grievance politician. He doesn't criticize others. This is just not who he is. These are private notes. He could have done so. We never expected us, us to see them, but there is none of that in any of these notes. A follow-up to Lynn's question. Uh, you must have felt like, as you poured through these notes and letters, like a person in the candy store. <laughs> I wonder what emotions you felt as you read through these notes and letters. Well, Cynthia well knows that when I speak about Lincoln, sometimes she will say to me in a wonderful way, please do not cry. Wow. I find myself very emotional about this. This is really wonderful stuff. His speeches, I, second inaugural, I think is just incredible. But I felt very emotional, Barbara, in, 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 in encountering these notes. And I didn't know all of these notes at all. I mean, if I were to rewrite my biography, which was written and published in 2009, I, I would do it differently now because I think I didn't fully grasp at that time the private Lincoln behind the public Lincoln. And so, yes, reading these notes and thinking about them at some length and time 
often is a very emotional experience. Thank you for your question. Want to see the chat? Yes, just click on the chat. So you all are consulting the time, so I, I don't want to go over our time, but I'm happy to answer any other comments or questions. I'm not sure I'm unmute, unmuted. There we are, Bill. Yeah. Oh, Ron. Thank you. Uh, as usual, my goodness. Um, Outstanding. <laughs> your, um, part of your uniqueness uh, in, uh, as an historian has been to examine the uh, childhood, the early years of these individuals. Is there anything in his private notes? You've, you've mentioned uh, his humility and, and so forth, but in the, in the private notes, anything else that uh, uh, would give uh, um, the influence of his background and so forth? Thank you, Bill. Well, all of us who are involved in ministry are very much involved in formation and the whole idea of the way young people are formed. And so, yes, you're correct, Bill. I have spent more time in my biography of Lincoln and of Grant. I think in a lot of modern biographies, it's almost like, well, let's get to the heart of the matter when the person is the president or this, that, or the other. I even had readers say, why are you spending so much time on the young person? Unfortunately, only one note was written in the 1830s that survived only six from the 1840s. Think of it, Lincoln is a young man. Even when he comes to New Salem, he sleeps in the back of stores. As a kind of single man, he might board with a family for three or four weeks, not exactly conducive to keeping all of these notes. So I imagine that he might have written notes. I, I'm convinced he wrote notes earlier but unfortunately, the notes that have survived are only notes more of the mature Lincoln. So we do not have reflections on his youth. Thank you. It looks like there's one more question and that might be time after this one. Um, I have a question from Bryce Little. Where did you locate the Lincoln note? The Lincoln notes are now, Bryce, thank you for the question, are all in Springfield, 110 of the 111. But they weren't all in Springfield originally. Over the years, uh, they digitized these notes. For example, the Huntington Library, the, the, the leading place for Lincoln papers is the Library of Congress. Second is the Abraham Lincoln Library in Springfield. Third is Brown University. John Hay was a graduate of Brown University, and, and almost a tide for third would be the Huntington Library. So once upon a time, the then editor of the Lincoln Papers came to the Huntington Library, and after a lot of negotiations, was able to digitize all of the Lincoln Papers resident at the Huntington Library. So that was why I was able, if you do decide to read the book, you will see in the appendix all 111 fragments and notes are published. I say notes because when Lincoln does get to the White House as president, the, these notes are universally almost entirely dated. But before that, they're not dated. They're written on the kind of paper that we saw at the outset of our program this afternoon, all kinds of different shapes, sizes, colors of paper. This is the way that he wrote his notes as a younger person. Well, thank okay. you very much for your interest and willingness to listen and learn and the questions and comments were very, very helpful. And because we all are resident together, we can continue the conversation. But I'm very happy to, if you're not in Pasadena, I've done this in a lot of the virtual presentations. I'm very happy to send a, a, a book plate, which if you can tell me how you'd like it signed, I can just send it to you and you can put it in your book. Can I sneak one more question in? Yes. I'm just, I'm curious about what the reaction has been from other historians um, to this kind of new revelation about the private Lincoln. Well, some have said, uh, you know, we need to put this book alongside of the very, of the collected works of Lincoln. That, you know, the, 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 the notes are spread out over nine volumes. Let's put this alongside of it as kind of a basic uh, reference. This is, this is something we haven't had before. I don't know what they've all said, though, Lynn, maybe, who knows? <laughs>
I'm well, not I, sure. I th thank you. And we all thank you for your uh, continued diligence in helping us understand and learn about Lincoln. And um, I, I thank you just for this, this hour together has been wonderful. Thank you. So Ron, uh, one thing I take away from this is uh, Lincoln's continuous uh, searching for answers. His intellectual curiosity was, uh, was alive day and night. And I see that in you too. So I think that's what <laughs> I want to take away from this, to keep thinking, to keep looking, to seek the answers that uh, are not answered yet for ourselves and for our community and for our country. So intellectual curiosity, that's a good thing to take away from Abraham Lincoln. Thank you so much. Next, next week, uh, we will have uh, two speakers, Harlan Redman and Ali Lee, our uh, two Presbyterians who are starting a new church in the Northwest section of Pasadena. And it's a mixed race part of the community. And uh, it's an interracial couple that's going to start this church. And they're calling it interwoven. I think this is interesting. The vision for interwoven is to be a church woven together as one becoming a witness of Christ's love in the surrounding community and beyond. To practice oneness in an, in an inclusive space where people from all walks of life can come together, engage authentically, and worship Christ in mutuality, peace, and love. So interwoven, that's uh, the, the program for next week. And uh, I'll just re-emphasize re what Ron said about uh, uh, his books are available for purchase and he will sign them if you contact him at ron.white at mindspring.com uh, or as he said, uh, he will send a book plate that he will personalize for you as a friend. Thanks again, Ron. Beautiful, Thank you. beautiful afternoon. Thank you.